In the grand and tangled arc of history, certain moments threaten to topple into obscurity. The mundane, the innocuous, the fabric of the everyday that unravels into watershed events. If I may, I'd like to show you one such moment to better explain the bizarre journey of the Kingmaker Diamond. It starts on the outskirts of Toria, where, perhaps unsurprisingly, the onboarding process of Aya and Winterlich General Service's third worker was experiencing a few hiccups. 23 marks? You sold it for 23 marks? Yes, Ayer, I unloaded your entire stock of wet, stinky cabbage for the exorbitant price of 23 marks. That was collectible, sauerkraut. I mean, for, for, if we could have got three times that price, easy. If you just knew what you were doing. Well, gee, maybe if you and your boyfriend weren't so busy, I wouldn't be tending shop by myself in the first place. The use of the word boyfriend for these close companions is interesting. It could be a slang term that's since fallen into obscurity, or it could be a mistranslation of the original German concubine. Unfortunately, we may never know. Oh, here we go. What, we can't even take a break? Oh, you're lucky you've got that rock in your head, because if you didn't- Lucky? How does walking around with a skull full of evil witch bait make me lucky? If I hadn't taken out one of Ariadne's eyes, she would have killed me. Right in my landlady's kitchen! Aye, well, if it weren't for the evil witch bait, we would have left you in Seltzenbald. I mean, clearly you're utterly useless as an employee otherwise. Ahem. <clears throat> Dinner's ready, gentlemen. If you're done here... Yes! No. Well, if you'd rather argue than eat your bouillabaisse before it hits room temperature... No! Yes! Well, it's your dinner. I'll eat it cold if I want to. Oh, you will. I will. Good! 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 Oh. <whistles> we'll save you a serving. Please, don't take this as me being invested in Ayer's well-being, but should we be... worried about him running off alone into the city at night? Oh, no, no. Aizen's a big boy. He just needs some time to cool down. He did the exact same thing when we argued the last time we were in Berlin. Oh, good! As Ice and Aya disappeared down the streets of Torea, Telus Four and Colette retired to the confines of the van for dinner and discussion. I take it you had some manner of disagreement with my business partner. He's mad because I sold our entire stock of sauerkraut. Oh, blessings be. For 23 marks. Ah. Miss Guys, it may be time to give you some remedial lessons in haggling. Is now a good time to mention that the last time I tried to negotiate with someone I blew up her head? I'll be sure to keep that in mind if we do any customer service role plays. Now, lesson one. Always know the value of your product. It was a barrel of old cabbage! How was I supposed to know? Lesson two. Don't be afraid to bluff. Like lie? I thought your people couldn't! Stopping that sentence there, thank you. In any case, Miss Guys, think of it as a matter of... finesse. Get a read on your customer. What they want, what they can afford, what you can sell them. Start high, start confident. Let them bargain, but don't make it easy for them. Don't show any uncertainty. Customers can sense weakness. Got it. Treat customers like dangerous animals. Ah, ah, ah. Dangerous animals with disposable income. Now, let's get you acquainted with our current inventory. Joy. Lie soap, a mark 35 a pound. Are you writing this down? Lie soap, a mark... What? Bread flour, 49 brook tail a pound. Walnuts in the shell, 3 marks even, but we can go as low as 250 for a good customer. Fire starters, 499. Summer sausage, 325. How much is half a pound of lye soap? 320. No. A mark 39. 35. I said half a pound, darling. You bastard! The quizzing continued late through the night, until the two eventually decided to retire for the day. Meanwhile, Eisen continued to pace indignantly down Calico Street, the main road through Toria's bustling manufacturing district. The factories had closed for the day at this point, the workers had all gone home, leaving Eisen alone with the rats that populated the alleys. I mean, she could have got at least 50, the idiot. I mean, what was she thinking? Oh, sorry, ma'am, I beg your pardon. 
The woman, who had seemingly appeared out of nowhere, turned to him and lowered the hood of her cloak, which revealed to Aizen a familiar face. Not one that he'd seen in person recently, but one that featured frequently in his nightmares. Ariadne Culver. And you must be Aizen Eyre. <laughs> Your little traveling companion has something that belongs to me. You're even crazier than I thought if you think I'll take you to her. I know what you're planning. <laughs> oh, Aizen, I can make you do whatever I want. But then I don't have to tell you about that. You look just like your mother, you know, before I inverted her face. Hearing this from Ariadne, Aizen was so incensed that he didn't even think before taking a swing at her. Ariadne tried to escape, but Aizen was able to keep in step with her, continuing to dodge every slash of her sharpened forearm. Nonetheless, he managed to back her into an alley. He saw, on the ground nearby, a discarded industrial fabric cutter. Briefly abandoning his wrench, he used a spell to manipulate the machine's blade, thinking it would be a more effective weapon. He was correct in this assumption, as it only took a single swing to cleanly sever the witch's head. Oh shit, I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> oh, I did it. Toughest flesh crafter in Valor, my ass. Oh, the look in Clay's face when I. Wait a second. Didn't she say she took one of Ariadne's eyes out? How come she still has both? Very observant. Aizen was so wrapped up in the physical impossibility of Ariadne's head speaking to him that he didn't notice the men coming up behind him with rope to tie his hands and a bag to throw over his head. What the Morning. Renowned in myth and poetry as the literal and symbolic bringer of the day, ushers in unforeseen possibilities and undiscovered perspectives. On this particular occasion, at a horseless van in the outskirts of a blighted town in an obscure republic, morning brought a chilly fog, a chorus of Valorian dog robins, a brick through the van window, and a message. Get down! Oh. Hmm. What? It seems someone wanted to reach us. Oh, don't touch that. You don't know where it's been. Did you miss the get down part earlier? It's a brick. It's not going to explode. Anyway, there's something tied up in this rag around it. Please, that smells awful. It's... Ugh, I think this is... A cutting of Eisen's hair. I'd know that salt and pepper anywhere. Look, there's a note. Taking some collateral on an old loan. Stop. For safe return of artificer, advise you pay what he owes. Stop. Bring some to Regenbogen Bridge by midnight tonight. Stop. Yours truly, Babyface John. Stop. Uh, this is a handwritten note. Why did they keep putting stop? Babyface John. Babyface John Schaefer, despite the encounter with an ill-tempered flesh crafter that left him with his distinctive appearance, was a terrifying figure in the underworld of Toria. A mentalist of prodigious skill and very few scruples, he was renowned as a very good party planner and a very bad man to owe money to. History has lost track of how his entanglement with Eisen Eyre began, but all sources would indicate it reached a new climax when... He's been kidnapped. That would appear to be the long and short of it, yes. How much does he owe this guy? Alas, my business partner didn't keep me abreast of the exact details, but... Well, if we could afford it with our current coffers, it wouldn't be worth going to the trouble of a kidnapping. We'll have to find another way to get him back. Oh, and throw that rag away, will you? We'll clean up the glass later. Wait, smell this. I would rather not. What is that? That's concentrated urea. Oh, oh, I am so glad you told me. No, no, it's used as a fixative in dyeing. It gets rinsed out before the fabric goes to market, so this has to be an unfinished product. It would have come straight from the textile manufacturing district. That's nowhere near Regenbogen Bridge. Would you carry this thing around if it wasn't what you had on hand immediately? So they're keeping him in the textile manufacturing district. Well, come on. 
Searching the neighborhood should only take us, so, a week? Well, we can narrow it down a little more. This is a brocade. They'd have to work it on a loom with a jacquard attachment. Meaning? Meaning we're looking for a specialized facility. As the trio, minus one, drove through the textile district, Winterlich at the wheel, Colette navigating the industrial landscape, they discussed the obstacles ahead. How familiar are you with mentalists? Like the guys who scam fortune-telling on the street? I'll take that as a not very. Listen, the ideal scenario is we don't have to deal with Babyface John directly. But if we do, be very, very careful. Or what? He'll guess my birthday? <laughs> Listen to me. Everything you hear, everything you see, everything you feel... There! That's where they're keeping him! It has to be! There? Are you sure? It's the only place we've passed that isn't in use. Best place to keep a hostage. Noted. I'll take us around the back. It looks like there's some windows out. Maybe we can get in through there, sneak around, find Ison, and... You can squeeze through those windows. I will need another way in. Right. Well, can't you just... Just... You know, just... Pop up inside? Not if I can't see inside. And not if I don't know who might be watching, no. We'll have to do this a long way, I'm afraid. If you can get in through the window, you should be able to unlock the doors from the inside. Great. I'll get you in and, uh... uh what's the plan? Usually, when it comes to de-kidnappings, we try to take advantage of any opportunities for distraction. With two of us working together, one could run interference while the other gets eyes and out. No, that's too dangerous. You let me in, then get out. I can take care of Eisen and myself from there. We'll rendezvous at the van. Be ready to drive. Do you know how to drive? It can't be that hard. Wonderful. Let me see your watch. Let's synchronize. Right, my... Uh... You don't have a watch? I didn't grab my full set of accessories while I was running away from the witch who wanted to murder me! I'm sorry. Fine. Take this. And that's a loner, all right? Store property. Okay, okay. Get in, get Eisen, get out, get away. Got it. Wait, back up. Usually? How often do you guys get kidnapped? You know, come to think of it, I believe he was actually kidnapped that time in Berlin as well. He was... Don't you think that might have been relevant information? I thought you said he was a big boy, Winterlich. I thought you said he could handle himself. I assure you, just because Babyface John's goons caught him on a bad day doesn't make him any less capable. It happens to all of us. It happens to all of us? Ah, the life of traveling merchants like us never once for excitement. Now, as I said, we need to move in secrecy. Once you get me in, I'll have free range, more or less. But you'll need to be very careful about getting in. Understood. Now go. I'll pull the van a little farther away and meet you at the side door at ten hundred sharp. That should give you time to move carefully. Now go! Never once for excitement. Great. Love it. I'm about to crawl through a window into Tetanus City and my new boss won't even tell me how often they get kidnapped. Wait. Traveling merchants like us? As Colette peered surreptitiously through the empty window frame, she was greeted by the sight and smell of a disused fabric manufactory. Featuring, yes... Jacquard Loom. I knew it! Miss Guise nimbly made her way inside, aided by the skills of stealth she developed in her years living as a courteous upstairs neighbour. Due to speedy detection by Babyface John's unusually perceptive lookout man, Colette was forced to rearrange plans. Forsaking all hope of stealth, she sprinted towards the door indicated by Telus IV Winterlich as the Crime Lord's underlings closed the distance between them. She reached the door moments before they caught her, fumbling with the latch for a few precious milliseconds. As they grabbed her and dragged her away, they assumed she'd only been interested in her own exit, and no one noticed the door slowly beginning to drift open in the breeze behind them. 
As she was brought deep into the heart of the factory to face Babyface John, the man behind this entire misadventure, Despite the conventional expectations of reality, Colette Geis quite suddenly found herself in a small but well-appointed tailor's shop. In contrast to the dim squalor of their previous surroundings, sunlight shone in through a window emblazoned with the words House of Geis. Bolts of fabric in almost every color imaginable lined the walls, mannequins displayed finished projects, and at the front of the shop, a customer was demanding attention. There you are, thank goodness. I need to talk to you about my order for the gala. Your order for the... Of course! Is everything all right? You don't need to cancel or anything, do you? Cancel? After how long I spent on your waiting list? <laughs> Heavens, no! I'm wearing a Geis original to the gala, and I can't wait to see Helena's face when I do. No, I wanted to talk about the trim. A Geis original? Of course! Now, tell me more about this trim! I know we were talking about surf and feathers, but I saw the most darling monkey fur accents in a fashion plate yesterday, and I was thinking... Hang on. Did you hear anything? Hear anything? I thought there was... someone... something... Oh, just the trade, I'm sure. I can't imagine why you started your shop so close to the tubes. Now, about that fur... We can add it to the design, but that stuff doesn't import cheap. We'd be looking at adding around 25 marks for each foot of trim. Oh, but for a loyal customer, can't we knock it down to, say, 23? No, 23 marks isn't... a good price. We could easily get triple that, couldn't we? Triple? But you just said... No, um, hold on... How long have I had this shop? Well, I don't know. And if you're such a loyal customer, why don't I know your name? What do you mean you don't know my name? Because none of this is real, is it? Well, Jesus Christ! This was the achieving your, your lifetime, lifetime goal, goal fantasy not good enough for you? What's it take to keep you distracted? Erotic hot spring the scenario? scenario? The vicious, the vicious revenge, revenge daydream. daydream? I could always just leave you in the endless tedium hole. Or the being eaten by your own ears hallucination. As the dreamscape dispersed, Colette found herself tied to a chair across from an unconscious Eisen Eyer, also tied to a chair, and behind him another man, standing just out of range of the harsh light shining down on her. This, as she was soon to piece together, was none other than Babyface John himself. Eyer! Eyer! Eisen! Don't worry about him. Just a dab of chloroform to keep him from pulling the machinery down around our heads. Now. What do you want? I want my friend, uh, my associate back. Oh, the artificer. Is that what this is about? Yes. I mean, what do you think I was busting in the window for? Hey, I'm a prominent businessman. Lots of people want to talk to me about lots of things. You weren't who I was expecting to come for Mr. Iyer is all. Oh, uh, you were probably expecting the other guy, right? Winterlish, yeah. What's he up to? At that moment, unbeknownst to anyone in that room, what Winterlich was up to was meticulously making his way through the shadows of the factory, moving wherever and whenever he could be unseen, slowly scoping out where his friends might be hidden. Out of town for a trade conference. I'm, uh, the new hire. New hire, huh? Welcome to the business, kid. Let's talk about your pal. I don't really know if pal is the right word. I told you it's Regenbogen Bridge. You didn't come to Regenbogen Bridge. I don't appreciate that. But you've caught me in a forgiving mood. Great, so... So let's settle it up, eh? Well, you know, the thing is... The thing is? The thing is? Oh, please, new hire. Tell me what the thing is. We're just, uh, not very liquid right now. Uh-huh. You keep it up with the excuses, and these are all going to be very liquid very soon. But we wouldn't just not pay you, sir. Of course not. It's just, we were hoping that we could, uh... 
It was at that moment that Colette caught sight of a familiar large silhouette moving silently through the factory, darting just out of sightline. We can pay you, just not in cash. Tough. I like cash. You'll like this too. It's collectible. One of a kind. One of a kind what? Only the finest timepiece I've ever had the pleasure of laying eyes on. Uh, a watch? That's your offer? Do you have any idea how much this twerp owes me? Trust me, you haven't seen this watch. I mean, no one has. I'm not even supposed to sell it yet. But, considering what we owe, I decided to bring it out of the vault. I'd take it out of my pocket to show you, but, well... Uh-uh. Sorry, doll. I'm not untying you. Don't think I don't know how that one goes. I can get it out of your pocket for you myself. You're welcome. As Babyface John crossed to Colette's side, several things happened at once. One, interesting but irrelevant to our story, was that an astonished farm wife several towns over watched her prize cow give birth to a litter of black and white kittens, at least according to her fervent account in the town newspaper the next day. Another was that the light finally shone full on Babyface John's, well, baby face. And the other was that Eisen Ayer's unconscious form left Babyface John's line of sight, freeing Telus Vor Winterlich to appear behind him with a vial of smelling salts and begin working on the ropes keeping him bound to the chair. As Ayer began to stir groggily, Colette redoubled her sales pitch efforts. A bit of metal magic from the man of the hour. A watch that winds itself. Applesauce. How long can that hold up? You'd be surprised. And not only does it wind itself, it's dust-proof, waterproof, rust-proof, smells faintly of lavender. As Babyface John, almost despite himself, lifted the watch to take a sniff, Eisen Ayer took the moment to reintroduce himself. Revived, but not quite revitalized, he stood leaning on his business partner for support, and summoned his trusty wrench from Babyface John's prone form back into his own hand. Okay, go. Go, go, go! The three made a hasty escape, Colette supporting Aya as Telus Four took one of his little shortcuts to the van and drove back to pick them up. Get in, get in! Go, 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 go! Chloroform hangover. Poor baby. Don't worry, we saved you some booyah bays. Oh, don't start. I'm just saying, if you'd had the sense to come to dinner with the rest of us, we wouldn't have had to de-kidnap you again, hmm? Oh, aye, sure, sure, blame it all on me. Good thing you're so good at de-kidnapping. Oh, you're absolutely right, but don't let me take undue credit. This time our young colleague took on most of the burden. Guys. Yeah? Thanks. Uh-huh. Oh, Colette? The watch? Uh... Colette? Lay off her, Telsey. I did let you know that was a loner. Aye, well, think of it this way. Would you rather have the watch or me? Well, when you put it that way... Hold on a minute. Hold on. We just left Toria, correct? Yes. Well then, where's the checkpoint? We had to go through it on the way in, so why isn't it here on the way out? Telus 4 was referring to one of many road checkpoints that were being set up on a trial basis across the country in the spring of that year. This was an effort on the part of then head of the Valorian Army, Commander Klaus Holtzmann, to crack down on exactly the kind of international smuggling that Ayer and Winterlich were constantly guilty of. I don't know. Maybe they moved it. No, they wouldn't have. Not in such a short amount of time. Now that you mention it, I swear we've passed that tree already. Oh, God damn it, we're still in the waiters, aren't we? Astute observation. The illusion of the van melted away, and in its place, Colette found herself and her two companions all now tied to chairs with Babyface John's men pointing guns at them. Yeah. Don't think I'd ever let you go that easy. You don't get to where I am being easy to trick. 
But four stars for effort, kid. Thank you. I really like that self-winding watch, see? So much that I don't care that it definitely isn't worth enough to pay off you guys' debts. But here I'm thinking, why would I take one golden egg when I could have the whole damn goose? Ayer, you made this thing ipso facto. You can make more of them. So what I'm going to do is shoot Winterlich and the girl and keep you around to make watches until I see you've made enough. <laughs> Not if I take your guns first. <laughs> Not if I put any artificer wards on all my boys' guns. Oh, come on. So you're an artificer now too? No, but it's not hard for a businessman of my standing to pull the strings required to hire one. Mr. Schaefer, if I may, playing devil's advocate here, let's say you take Ayer. Oi! Don't you think killing Miss Geis and I is a little... excessive? No. I think it's totally reasonable on account you both tried to con me, and I don't take to being conned. In fact, I'm so cut up over the level of disrespect you've displayed today that I'm going to kill you myself. With my own gun. Excuse me for a moment. Boys, keep them entertained. Winterlich, you wouldn't happen to have anything else we could try and trade for our lives, do you? Not on hand, no. Christ, Schaefer's got a small army working for him these days. How on earth would he able to get past all of them? I didn't see any of them when I came in. And I only saw one, the one in the middle. Hey, stop talking to each other or I'll shoot. Does it strike the two of you as odd that Schaefer went to another room to get a gun instead of simply borrowing one from his many henchmen? Everything we hear, everything we see... These people aren't real! And with that, the dozen or so men working for Babyface Schaefer seemed to condense, like the converging reflections in a kaleidoscope, revealing that, in fact, there was only a single man with a single gun. Hey, what did I just say? My gun! <laughs> I knew it. If he was too cheap to hire more than one henchman, he was definitely too cheap to hire an artificer to charm his guns. Hey, buddy. Have you got a pocket knife we can borrow? Once Eisen had gently persuaded John's assistant to cut them free, the trio tore out of town. Ahead of them, the road stretched into the horizon. Behind, the city of Toria toiled away, looms whirring, industry clanking to life. Deep in the heart of that unused factory, Babyface John returned from his office, gun in hand, to find three empty chairs on the warehouse floor. This episode of Kingmaker was written by Dana Shiwi and audio engineered by Meg Malloy Tutin, with executive production by Henry Galley. Our music comes courtesy of Vivek Abishak. This episode featured, in order of appearance, David Alt as the historian, Takai Nazir as Eisen, Blythe Renee as Colette, Josh Rubino as Telesfor, Addison Peacock as Ariadne, and Richie Ammons as Babyface John with additional voices by Addison Peacock and Meg Malloy-Tutin. If you're interested in supporting the show, please follow Kingmaker Pod on Tumblr, Twitter and Instagram, or search for Kingmaker Podcast on Facebook and Patreon. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you again in two weeks.